Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. We were discussing about truth and that you can explain, you know, freedom of speech and all that. Okay, we're going to do a quick rough, rough overview, okay? Uh, healthy digestion, like how the system actually works. And it's also going to be kind of cool because we're going to be doing um, classes like this, but simple. I mean, it, you know, for like basic people, um, like what do you do if you have reflux? What do, you, what do you do if your spouse has it? What do you have of diverticulitis? If you had some crazy diagnosis? Now, we're starting something new this Thursday. It's called an apprenticeship program. It's, it's something I've always wanted to do. I mean, in, in schools now, if, you know, most parents never paid attention to what their kids were learning, they figured that they were learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, okay, like, like you know, we did. Yeah, and they're learning a lot about social interaction that I, you know, should be more appropriate for somebody beyond teens. Okay, so, but we're going to teach anatomy and physiology, like how the body works. What's, what's a normal response to a cold? How do you literally get the nutrients out of your, out of your food? Okay, what do you do for joint pain? You know, so it's going to be practical. 60 minutes is going to be on Thursday at noon. And then a 30-minute Q&A. And the 30-minute Q&A is like really, really cool because anything you wanted to know. Well, you know, this disease runs in my family and I'll explain about genetic and genetic expression. Oh my gosh, I've had diverticulitis for forever. What antibiotics should I take? You know, we'll explain that. You know, I mean, no, seriously. So it's going to be a blast. But the, the, it's, but those of you that are supporting Dr. BVIP, God bless you. Thank you. You know, and Extreme Health Academy, I was on there for about a two-hour webinar. I do that every month. And again, Q&A is from around the world. It's just an absolute blast. But um, if you have any kind of health issue or want to stay healthy, get on um, Extreme Health Academy. Uh, you're going to find people that have had what you have had and recovered. Now, if you're wondering, um, why America, and I'm not talking, I'm talking pre-2020. Was anybody alive in here at, before 2020? Okay, okay, good. Okay, well, it's hard to remember back that because people's memory is really short, but we have the sickest industrialized nation in the world. And you might say, you're right, we're not spending enough money. Uh, or you might say, you're right, we just don't have the right drugs. Okay, <laughs> not enough vaccines, that's another good vote, okay? Well, that's all pharmaceutical interventions. No one's looking at glyphosates. No one's looking at the health of the diet. No one's looking at the health of the food. No one's looking at, at movement. No one's looking at electromagnetic fields or the causative factor. Why is 500 miles either side of the Mississippi a cancer belt? The reason is, is because we've had uh, insane people that have um, um, not a partnership, but an interrelationship with the pharmaceutical industry. Now, the pharmaceutical industry funds our government, they fund the regulatory agencies that are designed to watch them. So imagine if Boeing was funding the FAA, okay? Or, or you know, you know what's, what's the Russian airline, Aeroflot, okay? That, you know, if, if they're, it, that, that's in, insane. So you can't have the people making the drugs and the shots um, and allowing, paying to have those drugs and shots inspected. And then the people that are approving those drugs and shots, okay, actually have a financial stake in whether they're approved or not. Okay, this book details it out. Okay, get it, listen to it, open your eyes. This is a non-pharmaceutical approaches are the key to getting our health back. Okay, and you'll find out why we've been in a 50-year crazy thing. And honest to God, this, this, um, uh, is perpetuated in our schools. I was talking at a, at a high school a few years ago, and I'm looking at their health book, and there's stuff in there that's so wrong, you know? Um, I, mean, I mean, we can't get into it now because with the censorship, I can't talk about that stuff. And science, you should have a discussion. If somebody says, look, the world, um, the sun revolves around the earth, and, I'll, and somebody might say, no, I could look through the telescope and you know, map it out and say, no, the world actually revolves around the sun. You, 
you know, what do you need? You have a discussion there. So this book I really recommend. So let's get into digestion. Now you got a hole here and a hole here. It's literally a tube that goes through your entire system. Now this, this swallowing tube, the esophagus, hits the stomach. Now we're going to talk about it from there, but you've got three things that regenerate your system. You've got amino acids from the proteins. Okay, that's what you build everything. You got fatty acids from the fats, and you got usable sugars from the carbohydrates. Now, usable sugars, carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth. So this is why they say chew your juice. Okay, so you can stimulate the salivary amylase, so you can get the raw materials to build your body. Now, um, when you breathe in, you have a diaphragm, and and I like that red arrow there. It's actually pointing at one of the things that go through the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a big fat wide muscle. So when you breathe in, tummy comes out, diaphragm comes down. You blow out, the diaphragm comes up. So this is a movement of that diaphragm. Now you might say, wow, that diaphragm's on top of all those organs. When the diaphragmatic contracts and expands, would that move all the digestive organs? Yes, it would. Okay, that decreases stagnation, helps lymph flow. It's amazing. This is why in a lot of digestive orders, we'll suggest diaphragmatic respiration, diaphragmatic breathing. And if you have trouble explaining it to someone, well, I just did that to uh, a nice couple. Um, the wife was doing it totally different. This is what she was doing to breathe in diaphragmatically. And I was going, well, hon, you're not blowing out a candle here, okay? So she's trying to keep, create a back pressure, so I know that she had a problem with her lungs. But I put one hand on her tummy and I said, okay, dear, I'm going to punch in the stomach. Her eyes go like this. Okay, think of this. If you punch in your stomach, the air is going to come out. You're not going to go, wow, that felt good. So blow out on three. One, two, three. She blew out. Then breathe in. Fill it out. So push against it. So blow out and in. So practice diaphragmatic breathing. But that's literally moving that diaphragm down and up. So it's helping all the organ tissue move. Now. The esophagus literally pierces that. And this is kind of what the junction looks like. Now you can see that high part. This is the, the esophagus, the food tube coming down, dumps into the stomach. You can see how there's a transition. There's different tissue. That's because inside of the stomach is acid so powerful it will melt through wood. It'll melt through formica. It'll melt, it'll melt nails. Okay, it's amazing. And the key with this is how does it actually work? You know, because you've got this acid that can break down bone and meat, but why doesn't it digest itself? And we're going to show some of the cells on that, but it's literally, you know, and, and this, of course, if you're not aware that the body is an intelligent design, hydrochloric acid will burn through metal. So how can you make a cell that produces hydrochloric acid? Well, you have two parts. You got one with a hydrogen atom, one with a chloride atom, and the hydrochloric acid forms outside of the cell. Yeah, just random dumb luck. Okay, or really intelligent design. Okay, I mean, you know, you got to remember if we have a pharmaceutical approach to everything and we're doing censorship, this is not the smartest society the world's ever seen. So now, if you weaken that wall. Okay, that diaphragm, that muscle on the top where the food, the, the, the esophagus comes through, um, and you increase the pressure in the gut, like let's say you're not actually having good diaphragmatic movement, that stomaching cards start to pooch up. Now, at the bottom of the esophagus is a muscle, and it's called the lower esophageal sphincter. Why? Because that's on the lower end of the esophagus. Yes, anatomy is that easy. <laughs> you know, really, it's named for what it does or where it is. So when acid is in that stomach, so you need presence of acid in that stomach in order to increase that muscle, that lower esophageal muscle, uh, sphincter, to keep the acid inside of that stomach. Okay, does that make sense? And you need a good tone of that diaphragm in order to have that, that stomach contents, muscle, and esophagus be there. Now what a hiatal hernia is that round part of the stomach starts to pooch up through that diaphragm. So you have to have a weakened diaphragm. You have to have um, abnormal function of that gut. Now, hiatal hernia is one of the greatest mimickers. You know, you're talking chest pain, 
uh, heart palpitation, shortness of the breath. Why? Because it's punching up on side of the lungs. We're looking at the breathing muscles. So this is really, really common. And of course, since we're in an insane world, no one's going to look at the actual cause. They're going to give you proton pump inhibitors or antacids and, and you know, you're, why not a chemical solution? Even though what I just described is a mechanical neurologic distortion. Now, C2, 3C, or C3, C4, C5 keeps you alive. That is a mnemonic that helps you remember where the stuff comes from. So the diaphragm is, is nervated by the phrenic nerve, and that comes out of the middle lower part of the neck. So if you've had a neck trauma, do you think you might have a breathing issue? Gee, don't know. You know, where is the asthma coming from? You know, I mean, it's, it's just like, this is common sense. You have something that's not working right, look at its innervation. If the lights are off, what would you do? First check the light switch? Yeah, that's probably good. Okay, how about checking the light bulb? That would be a good one. Maybe checking the breaker switch? Absolutely, okay. Or then calling the power company. Okay, so we have various levels. Uh, to treat this medically, it's like making a hole in the ceiling, removing the light, and bringing it to the shop. <laughs> That's right. So here we go. Now, this is the lumbar, and you see how it comes up at an angle? Well, right at the base of the rib cage is where that diaphragm inserts and inserts in all the ribs. So if you have a, a trauma like that where it's angled, or you have a loss of curve with degeneration, could that indicate that there's a problem with the phrenic nerve? So what does that mean? That means you're not getting good oxygen transfer. That means that you're not, you're not, your blood is becoming more acidic. Uh, you're going to be in more of a stress state. So, and I love this. If you look at the, at, when I do the talk on the delusion of diagnosis, okay, the cause of most of these conditions is unknown. Do you know the cause of high blood pressure? It's unknown. Yes, I do know the cause. It's idiopathic. It's unknown. You know, I mean, come on, guys. You wouldn't treat your car that way. Okay, so you're looking at hiatal hernia. can be diagnosed with a barium swallow. Sure, a little radioactive stuff in your throat. How bad could that be? Of course, it may have to get filtered through the kidney, so it could cause damage. Damage is the gut floor. It's, it's not a benign procedure. Of course, the doctors, since we are pharmaceutically trained and pharmaceutically funded, okay, and pharmaceutically educated, because they you know, own most of the advertisements on the TV station. How about a pharmaceutical approach, a proton pump inhibitor? Now, this is something that decreases the acid production of the stomach. Now that, you need acid in the stomach for that lower esophageal sphincter to tighten up. So if you drink water, that dilutes the acid, that muscle will get weak. If you take a drug to loosen that, that gets weak. So you have an increase in acid splashing up inside of the esophagus. What does that lead to? The survey says, okay, more adenocarcinoma. I mean, it's incredible. Hi, we got to give you this antacid to prevent um, gastric ga juices going up into the esophagus, distorting the cells, leading to Barrett's esophagus and cancer. Um, and you might say, well, gee, doc, I just saw this out of um, the breast or BRJ Cancer Journal, published in EPUB. Um, that says it increases cancer. Well, yeah, but we're pharmaceutically trained. This is the only thing you got. Isn't that nuts? Okay. Stomach produces a ton of acid. Chief cells and parietal cells. Chief drink pepsin. Okay. That's, that's how you remember it. Chief drinks Pepsi and that chief cells produce a pepsin, which is really acidic, very, very low pH. And the parietal cells have the hydrochloric acid. Now, why doesn't the stomach digest itself? Okay, it doesn't do it because you've got these massive goblet cells. The stomach is actually digesting itself, but these goblet cells are always producing this beautiful mucus, mucus layer to protect everything. So when you look at this, this is why the stomach is always producing that layer. So look at the design. This is how you get the basic building products of amino acids to build all the, the tissue in the body. This is all the cartilage. This is all the tendons, the muscles, the ligaments, the everything. So this structure here gives you the available building products. And can you imagine damaging or altering that with the medication? 
No, that doesn't make sense. Hence, we've got a very sick population. Now, these goblet cells, if those goblet cells don't function and you get some acid that starts to irritate that lining, then you're creating a big problem. Now, so we have crazy people that would say that, that stomach um, ulcers come from too much acid, even though there's no documentation on it. But do you remember the old days? They'd say avoid spicy foods. Okay, for stomach ulcers, drink milk. Okay, good. Even though there was no data to support that because countries with high spice foods, like capsaicin, actually kills pathogenic bacteria and they have the low, very low rate of stomach ulcers. Whereas if you have a stomach ulcer and you're taking milk, that's protein and fats that's going to stimulate the gastric secretions. But you remember the commercials? It coats your stomach like it coats this glass. Or am I the only one that remembers that? You guys remember? Thank God. Thank God. Contemporaries. Brothers. Okay. So this is what it's supposed to look like. So I'm going to give you a mechanical, it's got a mechanical distortion. Let's do a mechanical fix. You take your left fist, bam, put it underneath the left rib cage, kind of right, right in the middle of your nipple line. You breathe in. Okay. Now don't do this if you're driving. Okay. And you breathe out and push in and pull down. Okay. And you can do this when you're sitting down. If you're doing it laying down, make sure you bend your knees so it's easy. But breathe in, breathe out, push in and pull down. Okay. And that literally has a force loading of pulling that stomach below. But that's a quick fix. That's not really the problem. What's the problem? You've got a compromised nerve to it, or you've got a, to the diaphragm, or you've got a problem with the insertion. You got some kind of mechanical distortion. You also have some kind of nerve pressure or problem that begins in the neck. And then if you have a drug problem, or let's say that you start to dilute the stomach acid. Now, digestion begins in the nose. You smell something, your stomach starts to secrete an acid to break it down. So if you dilute that, that acid with water or with, with just about anything that's not acidic, that lower esophageal sphincter won't tighten up. So drinking water with meals is not smart, okay? Drinking it between meals is good. No, you're not eating, sir, so you can keep drinking away. Wait, is that vodka? Okay, <laughs> never mind. Drive for it. <laughs> so when you look at this, that, that you don't want to dilute the acid. Now, you can do, you know, bentane hydrochloric acid as a supplement to increase the acid. I wouldn't do that more in a month. Um, baking soda, again, that's going to alkalinize the system. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Aloe juice, um, you know, these are all quick fixes while you're getting the neck corrected, the diaphragm corrected, and you're changing your diet to increase the acid, okay, to get off of it. But this, this will help you get off of the drugs, and so you're not uncomfortable. Or, or you're not, yeah. So now the nervous system, when you know that you live your life through the nervous system, nervous system controls every function of the body. Does it control hormone function? Yes. Gastric secretions, yes, everything. Okay, now you've got one nerve that supplies the gastrointestinal tract. That's the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve actually comes out of the base of the brain, and it goes on the front and back of the esophagus. Okay, that's the food tube that pierces the diaphragm. And then it supplies everything. I mean, it does all the excretions, the absorptions, the gastric motility, the everything. That's only 10% of its function. 90% of its function is sensory. So we have to know what we're taking in our mouth, what environment we're in. We have to know what kind of bacteria we're exposed to because you are a symbiote. You need pathogens to live. 45% um, of your DNA is viral. You've got thousands, tens of thousands of retroviruses in your body, and they've never done any harm. Okay, this is like vital, you've got four times, 70 trillion cells, four times that amount of bacteria and four times that amount of viruses. But we're living in a psychotic world that makes you afraid of viruses. Even though without viruses, you would be dead. You would not be here. Okay, so we need this. So now that vagus nerve, 90% of it's sensory. But if you're in a stressed state, you have decreased blood supply and nerve supply to the gut. So when you talk about everything, inflammatory bowel disease, um, hiatal hernias, uh, diverticulitis, colitis, any of those bowel conditions, okay, leaky gut, 
you've got to look at the nervous system first. Why? Because it controls and coordinates every function. And if you're in a stress state, okay, and think of this, if I go in there and I stand on your foot, is that going to feel good or hurt? You're right. You're right. If you have type 2 diabetes or type 1 and you have nerve damage, you could drop a brick on the foot. God. I'm talking normal people here. Oh, okay, you're right. That is most Americans. Okay, so look at normal humans. Okay, so if you're in a stress state, that sympathetic dominance is there. Now, we've got three stressors. You've got to deal with this and fix each one. Physical, chemical, and emotional. And that's the key to getting your digestion healthy. Now, here's a gal. Reflex problems. Does she have a problem with her neck? Absolutely. Does she have a leaky gut? Yep, that's abnormal bowel gas. Insertion of the diaphragm? Yeah, that looks a little off too. But how do you fix the reflux? Do you think the reflux is also linked to the stress state of high blood pressure? Do you think the sleep patterns are all there? Now remember, we're living in a psychotic world where there are pharmaceutical approaches to give you a drug for sleep, okay, which causes fatigue and, and anxiety and brain damage. They've got a drug for reflux, the you know, proton pump inhibitors that increase esophageal cancers. Um, they have drugs for high blood pressure that damage your kidneys um, and damage your brain. They actually increase your rate of stroke if you look at the Alabama study. So do, how about you just fix the problem, okay? Helical pylorus. Now, this is a bug that, they, that an Australian scientist found that everybody said, no, you couldn't find it because a bug that lives in acid, okay, in the stomach. Now, it says it's normal in half the world's population. I've seen studies that it's normal flora in 90% of the world's population. We know that it's, uh, it's found in a lot of peptic ulcers. So is this the cause? Like, you know, okay, let's just think about viruses and bacteria and funguses. Do they cause a disease in healthy people? Or do you have to have a weakened immune system? You have to have a weakened immune system. I'm in the germ theory. Just check out all our videos on that. So what happens is you have chronic stress. That decreases the function of the goblet cells. The goblet, and then you're going to produce some stomach acid, but some area of that stomach isn't going to have that, that mucus layer protection from the goblet cells. Stomach acid irritates it. Bam, helicopylorus gets over there. Opportunistic bacteria, fantastic. And that's where it comes from. And there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, bovine colostrum. I mean, this is brilliant. It works. But get the person out of stress. Diverticulitis or losis. We have a muscular tube, and this is the colon, that has this wave that pushes food through. Okay? And if you compromise the blood supply or nerve supply to it, the gastric motility slows down, and then you have an outpouching. Osis means condition of. Diverticulosis means you have an outpouching of that. An outpouching of a muscular tube. Okay? And the only way you can have an outpouching of that muscular tube is you have to have compromised blood supply and nerve supply. Okay? Diverticulitis means it's inflamed. Itis means inflamed. So what's the solutions for diverticulosis? Condition of an outpouching. Remember, it's a muscular tube. You have compromised blood supply and nerve supply. So you might be thinking, gee, that it, I just talked about the, the nervous system. So could this person be under a chronic state of stress, altering blood supply and nerve supply to the gut? Oh, man, so let's look at the physical stressors. If I stand on your foot or you have emotional stress, okay, all of a sudden you got to get away from that bad job, that bad person, that bad something. So blood goes to your arms and legs. This is a sympathetic. Where does that blood supply come from? The gut. Okay, this is where you get that sympathetic ability to run away from danger. Chemical stressors also. Let's say you're taking, um, oh, I don't know. Let's, let's go crazy and go down the a block to a fast food restaurant. So we get bread that's been soaked in glyphosate, which is an antibiotic and a mineral chelator. Okay, now you eat this stuff, it destroys the bacteria in your gut, allowing funguses and yeast, and the yeast have this little hyphae that bore holes in the intestinal tract that can weaken the wall, also leading to a leaky gut. So there's a lot of stuff that can cause this. So what's the solution? What's the solution? 
Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> okay, there's only one one microphone here. Hopefully you didn't hear that. Okay, you go to a medical doctor. You're good, my dear. <laughs> so restoring the nerve supply would be a good thing. You know, finding the problem, and, and this is what one, I mean, I had so many brilliant instructors. I mean, these guys were masters. Um, find the problem, fix it, and check to make sure you did fix it. Okay? Any, brilliant? Yeah. Yeah. I'm a good doc, but I learned it from them. Okay, so when you look at this, you got to get the person out of the stress state, so measure the stress, the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, you got to get them up to two to three healthy bowel movements a day, so they probably have a horrible gut flora. We got to get that working correctly. You got to change their sleep patterns. You have to look at physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. Now, in the medical world, for decades, They've been saying, don't eat seeds, nuts, or popcorn. They'll get stuck in those little things. You know, you got to be careful of that. You got to be careful. Well, let's go back on their history. Okay, so for over a thousand years, bleeding was performed. That means you have some red lines, which are arteries, some blue lines, which are veins. And the blue must have bad blood. So we're going to cut that and drain it off. Okay, that was practice up until the 1900s. They found out that that wasn't actually really good, okay, for you. And they were also using mercury, quicksilver. This is where, where the term quack came from. Anytime you'd go in, and this was used for 500 years, quicksilver, quicksilver, quicksilver for everything. Then they found out that it actually poisoned the patient. It was good in antiseptic, but it did kill the patients. So how long are we going to do this craziness? Here was a study out of 2008. They found out, 47,000 men, that if you ate nuts and popcorn and everything, why? Because those are hard to digest. You put heavy fiber in there. You've got a muscular tube. If you want a muscle to be stronger, do I just put this in a box and not work with it, or do I use it? Yes, you use it, and it gets stronger. So this is why high-fiber diets lower that um, problems with, with colon issues. It's fantastic. You're actually using it. But nuts and seeds, it lowers the risk. Oh my gosh, that makes sense. Now, the absolute risk of the most horrible diet on the planet, which is you know pretty much the Western fast food diet, although with the food shortage that's coming up, it'll look pretty darn good, okay? 2.5%. That means you're looking at 97.5% of not having an issue. So your body can really adapt to a lot of poison. Now, a lot of people are recommending colonoscopies. I don't. I mean, a fecal occult blood test is totally cool. You poop in a bag, send it off. But really, if you're, you don't need a test. I mean, in, in, in crazy world, I want to make sure you're okay. So I'm going to give you a test. Okay. You know, let me shove this up your nose. Okay. That's insane. You've never tested healthy people to see if they're sick. Okay. With some kind of disease. But this if you have poor bowel movements, you probably have an issue. If you have poor sleep problems, if you have pain in the gut, you have a problem. Okay, you need to look at the physical, chemical, or emotional stressors that's causing it. If you poop in a bag and you see a dark bag, there's a lot of different things. But you don't take someone who's asymptomatic and do a procedure that's dangerous. Serious complications occur in five in every thousand procedures. When biopsies or polyps are removed, the risk of serious complication increases. Perforation of the colon occurs one in every thousand procedures. For the, to prevent one death, you have to test 1,250 people. So you're looking at a number needed to treat. Now, one death from breast cancer, you got to treat screen 780 women. Now, what is that process, that, that mammography, that that we do in this country that's outlawed in a number of different countries that causes physical trauma and damage to the tissue, okay? You've got to do that 700 and something times, okay, to find one breast cancer. Okay, to prevent one death from colon cancer, you've got to have uh, do 1,200 people. And what did I just say? We had one in a thousand chance of complications in two different things. So you're going to save one and damage two or three. 
This was a study out of 16,000 members of the American Internal Medicine Journal. 82 serious complications, or five for every thousand colonoscopies. Serious complications was 0.8 uh, per thousand. Seven per thousand resulted in a um, biopsy or polynectomy. Um, perforations, post, uh, poly, post bleeding occurred in nearly five per thousand and 10 deaths, or um, 0.6 per thousand. And I did this study years ago when, when I heard on NPR, um, nine people died from colonoscopies. And I thought, wait a second, aren't they just shoving a camera up your bum? What's the process? Okay, and then I looked into it, and a huge amount of people aren't recommending it. Okay, intestinal flora. One of the reasons is, you have to take something that's so poisonous to your system that your body evacuates the bowel. Okay, now you're disrupting the gut flora. The gut flora is that you're looking at 80% of your immune system. So this is really, really important. So anything you take that damages that gut flora can damage you severely. Damaging the gut flora, and this is colonoscopy, has damaged the natural intestinal microflora, or causing a dysbiosis. Um, and when you look at it, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease can increase colon cancer 32. These are all the problems of damaging the gut flora. Um, IBS, one in 10 Americans has it. Is that because we're defective or chronically stressed and poisoned? Uh, yes, chronically stressed and poisoned. I shouldn't give you two choices. Okay, so you do not address the bowel issues. Look at the causative factors. Look at the physical, chemical, emotional stress. Bowels heal so fast, they, I mean, ridiculously fast. You're looking at abnormal bowel gas on the left. Uh, I think it was uh, 90 days later on the right, healed. Okay, the bodies heal very, very fast. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's amazing. Leaky gut. This comes, that, that's what it looks like. Instead of an, an intestinal tract that that looks about the size of a stool, it expands out to like this. Okay, that means that the integrity of the wall is off, you've got abnormal bowel gas in there, abnormal bacteria. But leaky gut literally means that you have holes bored in the intestinal tract. And this is common in antibiotic use. And again, antibiotic doesn't need to be the drug, it could be eating glyphosate soaked soap bread. So anything that damages the intestinal tract um, allows these yeast with a hyphae to bore holes in there. Now, if you get undigested proteins floating around in the bloodstream, the immune system flips out. You get undigested caseins and gluten from dairy and grain, um, the antibodies to fight those proteins negatively affect the thyroid. So how many people have a leaky gut and were misdiagnosed with, uh, with a low-functioning thyroid? Okay, I, I mean, you know, if, if we had um, five percent of our population, and we happen to be a herd of buffalo, okay, with a low functioning thyroid, would we want to find out what they're eating or what they're exposed to? You're right. No, we just give them Synthroid. Okay. Now this is something. Okay, I, if if I still had access to the college, so I could show you guys this. On the bottom of the stomach is this curtain of fat and blood. And it's called a greater momentum. It's the coolest thing you've ever seen. It literally, anytime, because when, I mean, think, think of back several thousand years ago. We're run, rummaging through the, the, the forest. You eat a berry and you actually swallow a thorn with it. That damages the intestinal tract. This curtain migrates over to the intestinal tract, surrounds it, heals it, and then goes back to hanging out. It's, I, I, humans are the coolest thing you've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. But to see this curtain of fat and blood, and I've heard urban legends, I didn't have a chance to look it up, but one of my teachers was uh, in the Korean War, and he said if somebody had a badly burned hand, they would wrap the greater momentum around it, okay? And, and it could literally regenerate tissue. I mean, amazing. I didn't know how they did the infection thing, but it, I mean, amazing. So the things you gotta avoid, glyphosates. It's a mineral chelator, it gets rid of the minerals. And what does the glyphosates do? Now think of this, this is every bread that's, that's commercially produced. This is in our water system. Increased intestinal permeability. That's also one of the main causative factors of Parkinson's. 
um, destroys the gut bacteria. What do we say? Increased risk of colon cancer. So this is stuff that shouldn't be there. Now, if we actually had a health system, one that wasn't sponsored by the pharmaceutical or chemical industry, do you think maybe this stuff might be pulled off the market? Yeah, except you can't do that. Okay, because this is funding a lot of the politicians. So you can't, not, you can't have this not funded. This is every genetically modified plant out there is designed to withstand this stuff. So what do you do? We've got to help the gut flora. We've got to help the gut flora. So anything that damages the gut flora is bad. Anything that helps it is good. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks. I really needed help on that one. <laughs> I mean, look at this. Celiac disease, gastrointestinal infections, diarrhea, critical illness. All this beneficial probiotic bacteria help because that's 80% of your immune system. Organic plant-based diet. When I say plant-based, I get comments like, he's a vegan. No, I was a vegetarian for about three years. But animals, you got to eat them if, if they're healthy. Okay, but there's lots of cultures out there that live off plants and they're totally cool. Fermented veggies, raw dairy, fantastically good for healing certain conditions. On artichokes, berries. I mean, this is amazing. We just planted goji berries up at uh, the farm. And in getting in, if you've had gluten sensitivity, the, the sourdough, sprouted grains, those are going to be good to start with, but you've got to get the problem fixed first. So heal the gut. Healthy nerve supply. If you're taking drugs, find why you're having to take those drugs. And, and oh, by the way, if you're taking, if you're over 60 and you're taking the standard 12 prescriptions, let's say that, that you and me, okay, we're left alone on a, on a deserted island and you only have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh fish, and fresh water. You have no access to pharmaceuticals. Does your health improve or decline? What does 100% of the people say? Improve. Okay, now, you're still taking those drugs. Let's pick a grandchild that you don't like. Wait, no. No. You know, it, you got to figure you're not suffering from a lack of drugs. Your body is intelligent, responding correctly based on the stimulus. Okay, does, does that make sense? And it's just basic, basic, basic sense. Find the problem. If you have a doctor that only has a pharmaceutical option, that's not a real doctor. They're a medications Pez dispenser. Okay. And did anyone eat Pez? Okay. I mean, gross, gross. Okay. And this is why we put nerve supply, exercise, proper nutrition, sufficient um, rest and prayer and meditation. And I tell my patients, look, you're going to eat like your great grandparents. Why? Because they were crazy. They only ate organic, they ate seasonal, and they ate fresh. Now, we're going to get into um, the censored part, okay? And this is um, stuff that we can't talk about. But I also want to introduce, this coming Thursday, we have an apprenticeship program. And this is what I talked about at the start. So 60 minutes Q&A, it starts Thursday. You got to go to the Dr. B VIP sign it, to sign up for it. Um, and we're going to get into this now, now, while John wipes this out.